Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash WTech. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Washington Tech Policy Podcast, episode number nine. Moving the needle. Welcome to the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. Curating communications, media, and tech policy news so you don't have to. News, interviews, everything you need without the axe to grind. It's the Washington Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. The House approves the Judicial Redress Act, which now moves to the Senate. The FCC caps prison phone rates at 11 cents a minute. And Casey Ray joins us today. The House has approved the Judicial Redress Act, which would give Europeans the same data protections they get from the EU. The voice vote came on the heels of the EU Court of Justice's October 6th decision to strike down the safe harbor provision that for years governed U.S. tech companies' ability to access European users. The next stop is the Senate, and Politico noted the Judicial Redress Act could conceivably be tacked on as an amendment to the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, which the Senate is due to vote on later today. At its open meeting last week, the FCC for the first time capped prison calling rates at 11 cents per minute. This is down from what the FCC says had gone to as much as $14 per minute. The new rules also bar most add-on fees. Former CBC chair Marsha Fudge from Ohio said the rule is a step in the right direction, but that prisons should be banned from taking payments from prison phone companies in exchange for exclusive contracts. Also at the open meeting, the FCC proposed some new rules to streamline the process for foreign investors who want to own broadcast licenses. These streamlined procedures would be the same as the common carrier ones. In short, the public interest standard of review of foreign ownership applications would not change, and the 25% of the market benchmark would stay in place. On a 24 gigahertz, which the commission also proposed rules for last week, the agency wants to free up that part of the spectrum for things like 5G mobile service and unlicensed spectrum. The specific bands relevant here are 28 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, 39, and 64 to 71 gigahertz. The Senate is expected to vote two Today, Tuesday, on amendments to the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act, CISA, according to Politico. One of the amendments includes Senator Ron Wyden's, which would strip out Europeans' personal data before they even get to the U.S. Should local police departments be required to obtain a warrant before using Stingray cell phone tracking devices? That's an open question after last week's House Oversight Committee hearing. House members grilled the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security about its practice about their practices of using Stingray devices to simulate cell towers and thus intercept suspects' communications. On the day of the hearing, the two agencies released their Stingray policies, establishing a warrant requirement except where it would be, quote, objectively unreasonable to do so. But John Fritz over at the Baltimore Sun notes that it's still not clear whether and to what extent local police need to obtain warrants to use Stingray. Also this week, a busy tech week on the Hill, the House Energy and Commerce Committee will hold a hearing about how open internet regulations will affect investment in broadband. That's happening later this morning at 10 a.m. in Rayburn 2123. Then tomorrow, there will be a hearing about broadband deployment, same committee, also in Rayburn 2123. Then in the upper chamber on Wednesday, Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel will appear before the Senate Commerce Committee for her confirmation hearing for another five-year term. This will be the commissioner's second term, and that will take place in Russell, room 253. The New York Times reported on Sunday that American military and intelligence officials are concerned about Russian naval vessels operating dangerously close to undersea cables that enable global communications. The Times reports that officials are even more fearful about the threat than they were during the Cold War because the Russians are accelerating their activity around the globe. There are concerns that Russia would cut fiber optic cables, hampering the ability of the West to communicate. 
European Commissioner of Competition Margai de Vestaya issued a decision that struck down tax advantages the Netherlands gave to Starbucks and Luxembourg gave to Fiat. Observers, including Politico, see this decision as an entry point for the EU to now begin cracking down on tax advantages given to U.S. tech companies, including Apple, which currently pays just a 2% tax rate in Ireland. The White House released a strategy for American innovation last week. In it, the National Economic Council and OSTP outlined six key elements for the U.S. to remain competitive, broken down into the ingredients for innovation, such as research and STEM programs fueling private sector innovation and empowering innovators, and strategic initiatives, such as creating quality jobs, catalyzing breakthroughs, and making government more innovative. The Copyright Office released a draft five-year strategic plan in which it envisions its future technological capability. The plan comes amidst criticisms that the agency is behind the times when it comes to its technology. The report is open for public comment until late November. Finally, Capital Records LLC versus Pandora Media Incorporated in the New York State Supreme Court is the case in which Pandora has agreed to pay $90 million to several record labels for songs recorded prior to 1972. Pre-1972 works are subject to state law, not federal law, until the year 2067. Pandora's primary argument for performing pre-1972 works is that it would be subject to a patchwork of state laws, thwarting its ability to remain profitable. But this is a settlement, and the company says it is not an admission of wrongdoing. Pandora is swatting off several similar lawsuits still pending. Stay tuned for my interview with Casey Ray of the Future Music Coalition, who will be telling us a little bit more about the state of copyright law. For you, the listeners of the Washing Tech Policy Podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You'll be amazed at how much more informed you'll be after signing up for Audible. And because of the glory of unlicensed spectrum, you can use a Bluetooth connection to listen to Audible in the car, in the kitchen. Anywhere you can get Bluetooth, you can get Audible. How about How Google Works by Eric Schmidt, Jonathan Rosenberg, Alan Eagle, and Holter Graham. You can download How Google Works or another audiobook free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at audibletrial.com forward slash WTech. My guest today is Casey Ray, the chief executive officer of the Future of Music Coalition. He's also a musician, recording engineer, educator, and author. Casey regularly speaks on issues such as emerging business models, creators' rights, technology policy, and intellectual property at major conferences, universities, and in the media. He has testified before Congress on artists' rights and is committed to building bridges across sectors in order to identify possible solutions to common challenges. Casey has written dozens of articles on the impact of technology on the creative community in scholarly journals and other publications, and is a regular commentator on the impact of technology on creators and media outlets, such as NPR, Washington Post, New York Times, Politico, Billboard, LA Times, Gizmodo, The Hill, Ars Technica, Sirius, XM Radio, and more. Casey is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, an instructor at Berkeley Online, and the president of the board of the National Alliance for Media, Arts, and Culture. He is the principal of Hiru.us, a media technology and policy consultancy. In his spare time, spare time in quotes, he runs the D.C.-based label Lux Eterna Records and publishes The Contrarian Media. Please welcome Casey Ray. Tell me about how you got into this work and, you know, what made you interested in music? What made you interested in artist rights and, you know, what brought you to D.C.? I have the, the, the probably weirdest route to this kind of work that anybody uh, could imagine. I am not really trained in any of these uh, disciplines. I'm not a lawyer. I started out as a musician. I went to uh, college for jazz guitar when I was 16 years old, believe it or not. Uh, did that for a couple of years and then went out into the world to sort of uh, make my way as a musician. And countless gigs and uh, performances and recording sessions later, 
I found myself being drawn more to engineering. And then after that, uh, I was a full-time music journalist. So all of my life, it's been music. Uh, I've pretty much done everything around music that you can imagine. Pretty much vocationally, it's everything that your parents would tell you not to do. And then when, when I, uh, I, I was always kind of interested in politics. Like if somebody had asked me when I was a, a kid, like, uh, you know, what do you see yourself doing? I would have said, well, you know, I want to write or I want to get involved in um, civics or I want to play music. And even as a, as a youngster, I was doing things like writing essays and, and stuff like that that would kind of put me, uh, you know, I was winning like national awards and meeting politicians and stuff. So at the end of the day, I haven't done anything any different than what I was doing when I was like eight years old. It's, it's really strange, except for the fact that I didn't go to, uh, you know, law school or, or, or whatever. And I wasn't on like a traditional track because I was out there trying to make it as a musician. And I had some success at that. Like I said, full-time musician, full-time engineer, full-time music journalist, and now full-time music policy uh, wonk. So it's been a very, very strange, but um, super satisfying kind of career arc, if you can even call it that. I came to D.C. actually um, to pursue uh, music writing further at a local paper that um, a lot of people would know the name of. And at the same time, I saw a, a position open at this organization, Future of Music Coalition, for a communications director. Now, I didn't know at the time, uh, you know, when I was working in music uh, on the artist side, but, you know, the bands that were I, I was in in the 90s were played on commercial radio stations in my region, which was the Northeast. And I thought that was, like, super cool, you know. Um, it allowed us to get better gigs and stuff. And then one day, all of a sudden, um, it was much harder to get the attention of any of the programming directors. I didn't know the reason for this, but it was actually because of a decision that was made in Congress uh, within a, a, a bill called the 1996 Telecommunications Act that removed the limits on the number of stations a single broadcast company could own. So overnight, it kind of ushered in the era of clear channel and uh, radio, which had been sort of until then a, a fairly competitive landscape of mom and pop owned commercial stations that were in competition with each other. Well, overnight, we kind of moved towards a situation where it was like a national jukebox where you could drive from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon, and depending on what format you were listening to, you're just going to hear the same five songs from coast to coast. I didn't know the reason uh, behind that was a, a set of federal policy decisions, but when I came to D.C., I saw this organization, Future Music Coalition, that was working on this stuff, uh, not only analyzing the trends in the policy space and in the marketplace, but also conducting original research that could be useful to policymakers. I was like, okay, sign me up. And uh, also, you know, they were doing this for the benefit of folks who were very much underrepresented in the federal policy conversations, the independent creator community. Because here in D.C., we have, you know, trade industry groups that have been here for an awful long time, National Association of Broadcasters, the Recording Industry Association of America, and so on and so forth. And while some of these organizations may, uh, their interests may align with artists some of the time, it's not always, and even when the interests do align, it's usually through the sort of fairly narrow market position of those uh, individual industries. So Future Music Coalition uh, was this organization that was doing this work on behalf of a community that I was already a part of, and I really wanted to figure out a way to participate in, in that advocacy, that education, and in that research that the nonprofit was doing. And that was eight years ago. I've been there ever since, and slowly but surely, got pulled into more of the policy side of it, uh, developed a, a real appetite and, I think, aptitude for some of that stuff, and then ended up over time kind of being in a position to lead the organization, and that's that brings us to today. Awesome. So we're here today to talk about internet radio versus broadcast, and I'm a huge, my background is in radio, but now I'm just a huge internet radio fan. Yeah, anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I'm going to every now and then throw out, you know, just anything from from rock to EDM, anything like that. And it's just you know, it's just something that a medium that I've really grown to love. It started out with Pandora, um now it's Spotify. And so, you know, you know, really want to kind of dig into some of the policies around that, you know, and how how are musicians <laughs> getting paid um because you know this stuff better than anybody. And I guess we can start with, you know, what are some of the different types of performances of music that are covered under copyright laws and 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 copyright mm -hmm. regulations? 
Well, uh, you know, essentially copyright um, is a set of exclusive rights that belong to the author or the creator of a work until they uh, choose to transfer that to an outside entity like a label or publisher under certain conditions. And there's, uh, you know, about five core rights that attach to um, a creative work that's fixed. Uh, and by fixed, we mean recorded in some tangible form in, in the case of music. The, uh, there are two um, core copyrights in a piece of music, actually. There is the musical work, and you can think of that as notes on paper plus lyrics, and that is the underlying composition. Uh, and the other side of it is the sound recording, which would be an actual performance that's captured on tape or hard drive um, or CD or MP3 or whatever. So essentially, the uh, the musical work belongs to the composer or songwriter until they uh, enter into an agreement with a music publisher, uh, and the sound recording would belong to the band or the or the performer um, that is capturing that on tape in a recording session until they uh, sign to a label. So that's kind of roughly the universe of of musical copyright. Now within those uh, that dual copyright in music, you have exclusive rights that kind of function differently depending on what part of the use environment or marketplace we're talking about. So you have a right to, the core right is the right to make copies. That's the copy and copyright. So you've got the the uh, reproduction right. That's an essential right. You've also got the right to distribute, uh, which would be to sort of make it available uh, to various uh, third parties or other users. And then there is the right to public performance, which I think is what we're talking about largely when we're looking at the radio ecosystem, whether it is uh, internet radio or traditional radio. And that all and, and the performance right for for musical works uh, also extends to the universe of any place where music is publicly played. So that could be uh, live concert venues, clubs. It could be restaurants, it could be bars, it could be retail, it could be hotels, it could be so on and so forth. So forth. So if we're talking about uh, internet radio, we're largely talking about the right to publicly perform the work through some type of digital audio transmission. And in the law right now, digital radio includes satellite radio like Sirius XM, uh, webcasters like Pandora, and also uh, cable radio, which people don't think about very much, but is a, is actually a thing. If you were uh, if you subscribe to say Comcast for television or Verizon for television or whatever, and you get to the high end of your cable dial, you're going to bump into these channels that are music channels, not music video channels. They just play music. So that is also considered uh, a, a form of digital radio. All of those radio or radio-like platforms are eligible for what's called a statutory license. And this means that they have to pay uh, a public performance right to sound copyright owners, so that is labels and performance uh, performing artists. And they do that through a nonprofit organization called Sound Exchange, which collects and distributes those royalties uh, on behalf of labels and performers. And the cool thing about the way that royalty is structured is is that it pays artists directly. It pays them 45% to the featured performer or band, 5% that's managed by the musicians' unions for uh, backup singers and musicians, and then the other half goes to the label. But unlike any other kind of royalty that I've ever encountered, say for royalties for sales of CDs if you're a signed artist, the label would pay you for that uh, depending on your contract. But for the public performance right for digital, you know, this money is paid not only directly to the artist, but the label never touches the artist's half. So that's kind of a major advancement in artist royalties. And it's only existed since around 1996, because this is a new right that was enacted by Congress at that time. Keep in mind that AMFM radio is not obligated by federal law to pay sound copyright owners or performers anything. They do pay songwriters and publishers through the performing rights organizations, ASCAP and BMI, but they are not legally obligated to pay performers and labels. Um, a satellite radio uh, provider like Sirius XM or Pandora pays performers, labels, songwriters, and publishers. So, you know, we have a very kind of uneven playing field right now with regard to royalty obligations 
And that actually not only distorts kind of the marketplace, because if you're Pandora, like you're basically paying something that your competitor isn't, uh, you're paying, <laughs> you know, to make it even more complicated, you're paying actually under a different rate setting standard than satellite radio, but we can get to that later if you want to. Uh, and if you're on the artist side, I mean, you're, you're kind of like, wow, terrestrial radio, if they're playing me, isn't paying me a dime. But the thing uh, to consider about this is like, you know, maybe American radio isn't playing um, a, a whole ton of performers, but overseas, a lot of legacy artists like R&B artists or, class, uh, or jazz artists, for example, that didn't write their own material, but nonetheless, you know, made this stuff really, really globally um, uh, a huge thing aren't able to collect money that's owed to them for overseas plays. So fundamentally we have a lot of imbalances in our current copyright law that I think are going to be looked at very, very closely by Congress in the coming years. And hopefully we'll arrive at a solution where artists are paid, paid fairly and everybody who is supposed to pay is paying um, and nobody's getting a free ride. On the other side of that, you want to be able to have services exist uh, and not be disadvantaged inherently by the lopsidedness of the royalty obligations or by rates that are kind of too impossible for them to uh, pay and also run a service. Because basically in this environment, for artists, you have to be played to get paid. And the promise of internet radio is that it plays like something like 80% more music than terrestrial radio ever could. To me, that's a positive, so we have to find the sweet spot to make sure that we can grow this legitimate digital marketplace and also get the uh, creators compensated with the least amount of interference between the money that they're owed and the cash in pocket. There's a lot of convergence in all these different media, you know, when you, you have Netflix on the video side, and then now you have mm -hmm. terrestrial radio, you know, with iHeartRadio, now they're also in major internet uh, radio stations. So do they have to play, do sure. they have to pay both broadcast and internet royalties now, or do they, or are they just they just get to get away with just paying the broadcast royalties? Well, if you're a uh, imagine if you're just a regular old radio station, you got a big antenna and you're broadcasting over the airwaves. If you're just doing that, you're only obligated to pay uh, songwriters and publishers through the traditional performing rights organizations, ASCAP and BMI. If you have a digital uh, simulcast, uh, like you mentioned iHeartRadio, which is essentially um, Clear Channel before they changed their name, uh, they operate you know, both obviously a digital um, property, webcasting property, and traditional radio stations. So if they're just looking at, if you're just looking at the FM side of that, they're only paying the um, songwriters and publishers. If you look at the digital side of the coin or their properties, where they're webcasting, they are obligated to pay the sound copyright owners, which is uh, usually the labels, but sometimes the artists, the performers, the songwriters, and the publishers. So again, it's, it's very, very uneven. Now, if you're Pandora, if you're what they call a pure play, uh, webcaster, you're paying everybody. You're paying for the musical work, which is the composers and the publishers, and you're paying for the sound recording, which is the labels and the performing artists. So it's very, very uneven. And that's part of what, you know, I think is making it very, very tricky to achieve so-called parity in the music licensing environment. There are many, many other issues that complicate the, uh, the space, but uh, this is one of the fundamental things that until that imbalance is addressed, it's going to be much harder to come up with a streamlined and, and more logical uh, music licensing environment. So what needs to change in terms of different legislation that's out there right now? What, what is it that Future of Music Coalition fights for? What, what are the different bills that it's, that it's advocating for? What needs to happen yeah. in, this, in this space for musicians? Well, you know, in my opinion, and also this is a, a viewpoint that's uh, shared and endorsed by my organization, the fundamental thing that you need to fix first is this exemption that allows AM, FM radio to not pay a performance royalty to performers right. because that essentially warps the market right out of the gate. And again, it's, it's kind of, you can look at it as an imbalance of trade too. Essentially what's happening is the United States, for whatever reason, has decided that it's okay to give away the, the product of an American labor 
force on a global on the global marketplace with no expectation of recompense. That's really weird. Well, I can't think of anything else that we'd export where we wouldn't expect uh, you know to be paid for it. It also again means that uh, American performers like again R and B acts, jazz acts, who might not be the songwriters of the material. Imagine this: uh, Otis Redding, for example. Uh, Otis Redding wrote the song Respect. A lot of people know the Aretha Franklin version. When Aretha, Frankla, uh, Aretha Franklin's version is played on American radio, she doesn't collect any money for that. Otis Redding's estate does because he wrote the song. Um, the same thing goes for uh, overseas plays. When radio stations in other places play that same version of Respect by Aretha Franklin, She's not able to collect that money, even though they do have a performance right in like 90% uh, of the rest of the world. Uh, she's not able to collect that money that's owed to her because of a lack of a reciprocal right. Now, Aretha's a pretty big name, so you might not feel as bad for Aretha Franklin. She sold a lot of records and has done well. But, you know, there's a lot of jazz uh, artists that are getting played around the world who aren't able to collect and, you know, they might not be in a position to go out and tour at this point. So that's just years and years, decades and decades of uh, American creators not being able to collect, even though the rest of the world recognizes this right. There are basically um, just a, a, a few countries that don't have a performance right for, uh, uh, for sound recordings. That's the United States is one, uh, North Korea is another one, and Iran is another one. So it's kind of like, not great company to be in. Um, if you address this, I think that the rest of the licensing um, issues that we're looking at, I don't want to say that they're, they're easier to resolve, but there's a there's a path to, to having greater parity and balance in, in the overall license music uh, licensing space. Because, look, if you're Pandora or uh, any other webcaster, you're looking at this like, why are we paying for something that Clear Channel isn't paying for, right? I mean, it's a competitive disadvantage. You know, I'm sure that some of these uh, folks that uh, use musical works and recordings probably don't want to pay anything or pay as little as possible. That's just like a normal tension in a business environment where you have a supplier of goods or services and a buyer or user uh, or distributor of goods and services, and there's always going to be some some push-pull between what they, you know, either party thinks is fair uh, but that's like different than just a glaring exemption where some folks aren't paying for their, you know, input cost at all. So I think that, you know, when you're looking at what is possible legislatively, I think that the place to start is probably around closing that exemption uh, that allows AM, FM radio to not pay. And I think that a lot of folks in the music community, um, you know, whether we agree or disagree on on other stuff are kind of like fundamentally on the same page about paying performers for uh, FM radio, uh, over-the-air radio transmission. And there are, are there a couple of bills out of those? I saw that there were a couple of, two bills, yep. you know, two or three years ago. Are, there, are, there, are those still active? What are the bills right now that uh, they are dealing with these, with these issues? The performance rights uh, fight goes all the way back to like, Frank Sinatra was going to the Hill asking for this. Okay. But back in the day, I think the big labels didn't really care all that much because they're, you know, you had a, you still had a um, sales environment where they're selling lots of records. So they're like, okay, whatever, um, you know, shut up and sing um, to the performer. Uh, now the thing about this is like, you know, it, it's kind of like we're moving to a new universe um, in terms of music uses and how, uh, people interact with music and hear music. Um, the sales model is kind of getting displaced by an access model. And this is, in some ways, putting a lot of pressure on radio and radio-like services to sort of make up the difference, right? Um, basically, if you're looking at the streaming marketplace, you've got a two-sided market. You've got one side where it's kind of lean back and it's more radio-like, like Pandora. You don't get to uh, choose the, the specific song that you're listening to on Pandora. The um, service like is, it can be customized to your taste based on what you like and what the algorithm thinks is similar to your tastes. Um, but you don't get to do things like you know pick the entire album that you want to listen to. You can't make playlists. You can't 
uh, download that music for offline listening and store it on your mobile devices or whatever. Uh, you can't share playlists or albums or songs with other people who use the service. Uh, but with a with a platform like Spotify, you can do all of that, right? So that's more of an on-demand experience. Um, more like when you when you uh, go to Netflix, you can choose what film you want to look at. Um, so you have this two-sided marketplace. One of the sides is probably substituting for sales and will continue to substitute for sales, right? If you can do all of that stuff with Spotify or RDO or any of those on-demand services, you don't really need that to download um, you, to say nothing of purchase a CD. Of course, um, that means that, you know, <laughs> some folks in the music industry don't really see the difference between the two things. They just notice that they're not getting paid as much as they used to get uh, paid in a transaction-based um, higher margin commerce universe. So that puts a lot of pressure on services like Pandora. And I think, so, I think some of that pressure is unwarranted because, frankly, there's been never been a point in, in history where we've expected broadcasting in any of its forms to make up for you know, soft sales. So the question is, like, how do you reimagine um, what you know music uses look like uh, based on the presumption that people are going to be accessing music than they are going to be owning it, whether ownership is you know physical media or you know even a download. So you know how do we grow the pie? How do we make uh, legitimate um, uh, music services viable? And how do we do that in a way that doesn't disadvantage, uh, you know, the actual folks who are making the music? Um, the problem right now is that there's still a lot of uh, ways that the the money, however, you know, w whether we're talking about micro pennies uh, on streaming services or whatever, there's a lot of ways that the money is not getting back to creators in a transparent way, in an efficient way, in an accurate way. So that's one problem. The other problem is do we actually have the laws and policies in place that will make it um, uh, easier to um, perform music for fans and also compensate creators fairly? So it's kind of like a, a tension there. Specifically, there are a couple of bills in Congress right now that are, that are actually going to be relevant to this discussion on both sides of the copyright, on the musical work side and the uh, uh, sound recording side. Uh, one of them is the Fair Pay, Fair Play Act, which essentially the linchpin of this bill is basically like closing the terrestrial radio exemption for FM radio, making sure that those guys pay. It also uh, would change the, the rate setting standard um, for satellite radio so they would be paying on the same kind of standard that Pandora is paying. There's probably going to be some controversy there. And it does a couple of other things that are a little bit more specific to um, certain folks in the music industry, like it would allow uh, artists to assign part of their performance royalties to producers if the artist feels that the producer uh, or the studio professional um, deserves a cut of that. But basically, the, the, the fundamental um, core component of that bill is making sure that terrestrial radio pays a royalty as well. And that's something that I endorse is something that our organization endorses, even if, you know, we need to look at the other sort of moving pieces uh, a little bit more closely. But generally, we support uh, closing the terrestrial radio exemption because, honestly, we, we think it's unfair to, that webcasters are, are paying for something that uh, terrestrial broadcasters aren't. And also, we want to make sure that uh, American artists are able to collect for a fundamental right that the rest of the world's creators enjoy. Um, there's another bill called the Songwriter Equity, Equity Act, which applies to musical works, songwriters, and publishers. That's a little bit more complicated. Uh, essentially, one thing that it does is um, it would provide for uh, the evidence in sound recording rate determinations to be available to any judge or bench that's um, responsible for musical works rate setting. So I can, I can tell everyone's eyes are just glazing over or ears are <laughs> tuning out right now, so I won't get too into that. But, um, you know, so there are a couple of vehicles that, uh, depending on, on, you know, whether or not there's appetite for compromise and energy to move these through uh, the legislative process, 
it could end up impacting the music licensing space. There's also the U.S. Copyright Office, which has kind of um, produced its own, you know, 300 and something page set of recommendations that are based on a much longer process where they convene stakeholders to sort of um, complain about stuff <laughs> and try to synthesize that into a set of recommendations. But basically, everything in the U.S. Copyright Office's um, uh, set of recommendations would require legislation to enact anyway. So at the end of the day, this is something that, by and large, Congress will have to figure out. There is a, a, a situation right now at the Department of Justice where uh, the regulators there are looking at the so-called consent decrees that govern how musical works performances uh, are royalties are arrived at, and that's another issue that is probably a little bit too nuanced to get into here. Um, but at the end of the day, if Congress wanted to get up tomorrow morning and and completely redraw the lines around um, how music is licensed in the digital environment, they have the, the right and the authority to do that. And at some point, I think it will have to happen or else we are on a sort of um, collision course with potential market failure. Casey Ray is the chief executive officer of the Future of Music Coalition. He's a professor at Georgetown and is the president of the board of the National Alliance for Media, Arts, and Culture. He's the principal of Hiru.us, a media technology and policy consultancy. And in his spare time, he runs a D.C.-based label Lux Eterna Records and publishes The Contrarian Media. Casey, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And you can find the Future of Music Coalition at futureofmusic.org. Absolutely. Thanks so much for being here. You got it. Thanks a lot. That concludes Episode 9 of the podcast. Thanks so much to all of you for listening. I cannot do any of this without you, so thank you. If you're new to the podcast, or even if you've been listening for a while, I have a free cheat sheet for all of my new email subscribers, and you can find the sign-up for that at washingtech.com forward slash cheat sheet. And that cheat sheet is a guide for you to get up to speed on various different policy areas, including cybersecurity, intellectual property, net neutrality, and other areas. Keep building your credibility in less time. That link again is washingtech.com forward slash cheat sheet. Thanks again to all of you for listening. I will see you back here next week. Thanks for listening to the Washing Tech Policy Podcast. You've been briefed. 